What's up? I'm Vin, and today I'm going through the August 2023 Algebra 1 Regents, and in this video, I'm going to do parts 2, 3, and 4. So let's get started. So first up, we have the part 2 questions, and every question in this section is worth 2 credits. Question 25, we have to classify the expression 2 over the square root of 144 plus the square root of 169 over 3 as rational or irrational. And then we have to explain our reasoning. So for this question, the first thing we should know is what does it mean for a number to be rational? So a rational number, the technical definition is that a rational number is a number that could be expressed as the quotient of two integers where the denominator is non-zero. So our integers a and b, the one condition here is that b cannot be zero. Now, a easier way to understand this is just to think of some rational numbers. So some rational numbers include numbers like, let's say, negative 3, negative 1, 0, and then let's say 1, 7, 8, and so on like this. So integers all count as rational numbers. But other numbers that count would be terminating decimals. So I could have something like 1.5. 3.7. I could also have infinite decimals as long as there's a pattern to them. So if I had something like five point, let's say 2828 repeating like this, this would be counted as a rational number because there's a pattern to that infinite decimal. So now we think about the example given to us and we have two over the square root of 144. So notice that 144 is a perfect square. So this sum here, if we write this out, we have two over 144 plus the square root of 169 over three, that's gonna be equal to, we're gonna have two over 12, plus the square root of 169 is 13. 169 is a perfect square. So we get 13 over three. So notice here that we have two rational numbers because we have two numbers here that are expressed as the quotient of two integers. And another big idea to know for these questions is that a rational number plus a rational number equals a rational number. So now we could use this big idea to classify this expression. The sum here is going to be rational because we have the sum of two rational numbers. Now, a few more things before we move on. This is from the model response set. And notice what this student wrote here to get full credit. So you don't actually have to write a whole lot to get full credit on this question. And now for a third solution, notice that this student actually simplified everything and got 4.5. And then in their explanation, they just mentioned that 4.5 is a terminating decimal. So this sum here is rational. Question 26, we have to use the information above to complete the two-way frequency table below. And we have Julia surveyed 150 of her classmates at City Middle School to determine their favorite animals. Of the 150 students, 46% were male. So the first thing we're going to do here is take 150 and we're gonna find 46% of 150. And we're gonna multiply here, 46% is 46 out of 100. So we just need to multiply these two numbers. So we have 150 and we're multiplying that by, and I'll throw this in parentheses, we have 46 divided by 100. And this product is gonna work out to 69. So there are 69 male students at this middle school. So there are 69 male students at this middle school in total. So we're gonna write that in this row here in the total column, we have 69 male students. And next up, we're told that 42 students said their favorite animal was a horse. So in the horse column here in the total, we're going to write out 42 because that's how many students in total like horses. And then we're told here that one third of those students were female. So now we just have to take one third of 42. So we'll just do 42 times one third. And this we're just doing 42 divided by three and that's equal to 14. So this is going to go in the female section over here. So we're going to have 14 females prefer horses. And now to find out how many male students prefer horses, well, there's 42 in total that like horses and 14 females. So now we subtract, we do 42 minus 14, and that works out to 28. So 28 male students like horses. So this is starting to fill itself out. So we're getting there. Now we have of the 60 students who said dolphins. So the amount of students that like dolphins in total is 60. So we're gonna write that out first. We're told here that 30% of the 60 are male students. So we have to take 30% of 60. So we're gonna do 60 times 30%, but just note here, 30% is 30 out of 100. And if I cross off the common zeros at the end, that's 3 tenths. So I'm just gonna multiply this by three over 10. And now the common zeros here cross out and we have six times three is equal to 18. So think about this one more time, 30% of the students that like dolphins were male. So the 18 is gonna go over here in the male entry in this spot over here. So now to find out how many female students like dolphins, we're gonna do 60 
minus 18. So there's just a lot of arithmetic to do for this question. So we're going to borrow 10 minus 8 is 2. 5 minus 1 is 4. So we have 42 females that prefer dolphins. And if you just want to check that you're doing these right, just add 42 plus 18 gives you 60. So, so far, so good. So now we've used all the information that was given to us. So we should by now have enough to fill out the rest. So let's think about, remember, in total, there's 150 students in this school. So if we look here, notice we could find out the missing entry here for the total amount of people that like penguins. We have 42 plus 60, so 42 plus 60, and that's going to give us 102. And if we subtract that from 150, that's going to tell us how many people in total like penguins. So this minus 102 would give us 48. So I know we're changing colors here, but we're just going to write that in the penguin entry over here, that there were 48 students in total that like penguins. And now notice that we're only missing one value here in this row. So if we add up, we have 28 plus 18. So we add these two numbers, we're going to get 30 plus 16 is 46. And we subtract that from 69. 69 minus 46 is going to work out here to 23. So there are 23 male students that like penguins. And now we could just subtract here, what is 48? So there's just a lot of messy arithmetic we have to do here. But that's just how you do a question like this. So let's see, 8 minus 3 is 5. 4 minus 2 is 2. So there are 20 five female students that like penguins. So now the last thing we have to do here is just find this value here. And there's two ways we could do it. We could add up these three numbers or we could do 150 minus 69. So let's just do 150 minus 69. So we have 150 and we're subtracting 69 here. So we can't do zero minus nine. We can't do five minus six, but we could borrow here and make this a 15. And then from here, we could do, we could borrow from this and make this a 14. So this gets messy. Just use a calculator to do 150 minus 69. But I'm already committed at this point. 10 minus 9 is 1, and 14 minus 6 is 8. So there are 81 female students in total here. And if we wanted to double check, notice that if we add, if we did 81 plus 69, it would give us 150. And if we add up all of these values here in this row, we could also check that it makes 81 and it will in fact check out. So this is our two-way frequency table completely filled out. Question 27, Brian said that the piecewise function graph below has a domain of all real numbers. We have to state two reasons why Brian is incorrect. So for this question, what I'm thinking about is what does it look like for a function to have domain all real numbers? And think of something like, let's say y equals x. This is an easy function to sketch here. It's the line here going through the origin, and it cuts the origin at a 45 degree angle. The domain here is all real numbers because it goes on all the way to the left and all the way to the right. It doesn't stop at any point. So just looking at this here, notice that at x equals 1, 2, 3, for 1, we don't have a function value here because we have two open circles. So that's one reason right there why Brian is incorrect. But another reason is that notice that this does not continue past x equals 4. The graph stops at x equals 4. So our second reason is that the graph stops at x equals 4. It doesn't continue to the right past x equals 4. Question 28, we have this nice physics formula here. The formula D equals T times V sub I plus V sub F over 2. And this formula is used to calculate the distance D covered by an object in a given period of time T. And we have to solve the formula for V sub F, the final velocity in terms of D, T, and V sub I, the initial velocity. So we're starting off with this equation here. We have D equals T times, and we've got V sub I plus V sub F over 2. And our goal here is to solve for V sub F. So we have to do all the necessary steps here to just get that term by itself. So notice that we have a times T in front. So the first thing we could do is just divide this by T. So we're going to divide the right side by T, and then we have to divide the left side by T. And that's going to get T over T to cancel. And now we have D over T equals, and we're left with this fraction on the inside. We have V sub I plus V sub F over 2. But remember, the goal here is to solve for V sub F. So we're just going to keep doing the opposite operations of all the stuff attached to get V sub F by itself. So the next thing I would get rid of here is this dividing by 2. So the opposite of dividing by 2 is to multiply by 2. So we'll just do times 2 on both sides like this. So now 2 over 2 cancels. And on the left side, we could squeeze these into a single fraction because what I'm imagining here, when you multiply 2 times D over T, 
that's the same thing as 2 over 1 times d over t like this. And that's going to work out to 2d over t. So we're going to have 2d over t is equal to, and on the right side, all we're left with is v sub i plus v sub f. So now v sub f is almost alone, but to get v sub f alone, we have to get rid of this v sub i term. So the next thing we could do here is just subtract v sub i on both sides. We're going to do minus v sub i on the left and right. And on the right side, v sub i cancels, and we have v sub f alone. And now we'll just swap these sides so we could say v sub f equals. And we're going to have v sub f equals 2d over t minus v sub i. Question 29, we're going to solve this equation algebraically for all values x. And we have a quadratic equation here, so let's move everything to the left side. So I'm going to start off here by subtracting 36 on both sides. And I'm doing this so that we could factor this quadratic equation. So we're going to have 36 minus 36 canceling. And we're going to have x squared minus 9x minus 36 is equal to 0. And now we have to come up with two numbers that have a sum of negative 9 and a product of negative 36. So this is where your times tables and your knowledge of integers comes in. So you think of the factors of 36, and 36 has a lot of factors, but the ones that work here are gonna be negative 12 and three. Because if we add these numbers, if we do negative 12 plus three, that's negative nine. And if we multiply these numbers, negative 12 times three is gonna give us negative 36. So these are the numbers that we want, and we could write x minus 12 times x plus three is equal to zero. And now we set each factor equal to zero. So we're gonna set x minus 12 equal to zero, and we're gonna set x plus three equal to zero. And now we solve these two equations, we're gonna add 12 to both sides for this first equation, and that's gonna give us our first solution here, x equals 12. And then we solve this equation by subtracting three on both sides, and that will give us our second equation, we'll have x equals negative three. So we have two solutions here, 12 and negative three. But remember, for this regions, you get three hours, so take your time here and check your answers. So let's plug in x equals 12 to the original equation here. I'm gonna have 12 squared, and then I'm subtracting, I have nine times 12. And let's see if this works out to 36. And notice that this does work out to 36. So, so far so good. And our second solution was x equals negative three. So now we plug in negative three, but be very careful here. Please make sure that you put negative three in parentheses before you square it. Because if you don't, this is gonna lead to a very dangerous bear trap, okay? If you just write negative three squared like this without parentheses, notice that you get negative nine. And the reason is by order of operations, this technically means negative one times three squared. And when you have an expression like this, if you did negative one times three squared, this is gonna tell you to do the exponent first, three squared, and then multiply by negative one. And that's why you're getting negative nine. So just make sure when you plug in negative three to this, that you do negative three in parentheses squared and then minus nine times parentheses negative three like this. Okay, so that's just a small detail on the calculator, but it gets a lot of students, so just be careful. And notice that we also get 36 here. So both answers for x check out. Question 30, we have to determine the common difference of this arithmetic sequence in which a sub one equals five and a sub five equals 17. And then we have to determine the 21st term of this sequence. So for this question, we could go to the reference page and they have a formula for arithmetic sequence. And the formula is a sub n equals a sub one plus n minus one times d, where d is the common difference. And just for a little background here, an arithmetic sequence is a sequence in which when you wanna get from one term to the next, you just add the same number each time. So I'm just gonna make up a random one here. Let's say I'm starting at 10 and then my next number is 16, then 22, then 28, and so on. In this case here, my a sub one, my first term is 10, but my common difference is six because I'm adding six each time to get from one term to the next. So I would have d is equal to six. So that's the idea behind it, which you could probably just think your way through questions like this if the numbers are reasonable enough. But if you wanna be super precise here, notice that they're plugging in n equals five. So if we plug in n equals five to this formula, we're gonna have a sub five equals, a sub one they told us is equal to five. And then we're gonna have plus, we have n is equal to five in this case, we have five minus one times the common difference d. So now this is gonna work out to a sub five is equal to 17. So we have 17 is equal to five plus five minus one is four, and then times d like this. So now if we wanna solve for the common difference, we could just work this formula here and do the algebra. So let's just write this over here. So we're gonna have 17 equals five plus four D. And now to solve, we're gonna do minus five on both sides. And that's gonna get five minus five to cancel. And we're gonna have 17 minus five is 12. 
that's equal to four times D. And now divide both sides by four. And that tells us the common difference here is equal to three. So that's one of the two points here. But if you wanna do a quick mental check or even do this off to the side, you could just think about this here and think if you're starting at five and you're adding three each time, you'd have five, eight plus three is 11, then 14, then 17. And notice this is my first term. This would be my second term, my third term, fourth, and there's my fifth term. Now you could, you could keep doing plus three until you get to the 21st term. You're welcome to do that, but that takes a lot of time. So why not just plug now into this formula here to get a nice formula for a sub n. So we have a sub n equals a sub one is equal to five, plus we have n minus one times d, the common difference we just found is equal to three. So if we wanna know what is the 21st term, now we just plug in n equals 21. So we have n equals 21 is gonna give us, we're gonna have a sub 21, that's our 21st term, is equal to five plus, and now we have n equals 21, so we're gonna have 21 minus one times three. And this tells us our 21st term is equal to, we have five plus and 21 minus one is 20. So we have 20 times three. And then this is gonna give us five plus 60, which is gonna give us 65. So our 21st term here is gonna be equal to 65. And here's our solution to question 30. Now, one more thing before we move on, look at this model response here, where the student just took 17 and five and subtracted them. And then they divided by four since a sub one and a sub five are four terms away from each other. And they found the common difference this way. And they even checked their work like this. And then they did this by brute force. They actually listed out 21 terms here to show that the 21st term would in fact be 65. So this is another way to do this. And this would also get two points. Question 31, we have to factor this expression completely. And notice that we have a minus two at the end with no variable attached. So that tells us that the greatest common factor is going to be the biggest number that divides both 18 and two. And that number is two, so that's our greatest common factor. And now for the leftovers on the inside, if you struggle with finding the leftovers on the inside, the way you should be thinking about finding the leftovers is that you have this expression here, the greatest common factor is two, and you're going to divide each of those terms, 18 x squared and minus two, you're dividing each of those terms by two. And that's what's gonna go inside the parentheses over here. So 18 divided by two is nine and two divided by two is one. So we're gonna have nine X squared and then minus one on the inside of these parentheses here. So this is our expression factor. <laughs> but be careful here, this is a very dangerous bear trap. We have to factor this expression completely, which means we have to keep factoring this until we can't factor anymore. And anytime I hear the phrase factor completely, that usually tells me there's gonna be an extra step of factoring. So the extra step here is gonna involve the difference of two perfect squares. When you have a squared minus b squared, this factors nicely to a plus b times a minus b. And if we look at this expression here, notice that our a term is going to be equal to three x because three x times three x would give us nine x squared. And our b term would be equal to one because one times one is equal to one. So now we could factor this even more. We're gonna have two times and we have two blank parentheses here and I'll write in the plus minus. So we have our a term is three x, that's gonna go first in both parentheses. And then we have plus minus the b term here is one. And here is our original expression factored completely. Question 32, we have to solve this quadratic equation algebraically for all values of x, and we're gonna to round to the nearest hundredth. So for a question like this, I know we have to use the quadratic formula because they're telling us to round. And if we try factoring this, you could go ahead, try to find two numbers that have a sum that's equal to three, and the two numbers also have a product that's equal to negative nine. So you're not gonna be able to find two numbers that work, and that tells us that this quadratic equation is not factorable over the integers. So now we have to shift focus here. We're gonna use the quadratic equation. So we have to know here that we have something right now in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. So when we wanna use the quadratic equation, which is on the reference page, we should identify the a value, b value, and c value. Now, since there's no number written here and we have a positive start here, our a value is equal to one, our b value is equal to three, and our c value is equal to negative nine. So we have to include the negative with it. So we have c equals negative nine. And now we have the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula is x equals negative b plus or minus, we have the square root of b squared minus four ac all over two a. So now we just plug into this and I would actually show the substitution step. We're gonna have x equals, and now we have negative. And since our b value here is positive three, our negative b is going to be negative three. And then we have plus or minus, and now we have the square root of b squared. And I highly recommend that you put the b term in parentheses before you square it because if your B value is negative, that bear trap 
shows up here as well that let's say our b value was negative three if you forget to write so if you forget to write negative three in parentheses before you square it you're not going to get positive nine like you should you would get negative three squared on the calculator is negative nine okay so just be careful in this case here b is positive so we don't have to worry but if b is negative just look out because that gets a lot of people so you have minus four times a is equal to one and c is equal to negative nine and now this is all under the same square root and now we're dividing this all by two times a, and a is equal to one. So now we could type this in on the main screen. We're gonna press alpha y equals enter to pull up a blank fraction. And now we have negative three, and we have to do plus or minus. So I'm gonna do plus first. We have plus, and then square root is second x squared. And now I'm gonna write, we have parentheses three, and then we're squaring the three, and we're subtracting, we have four, and then parentheses means multiply. So we have four times one, and then we're multiplying that by negative nine. So this is all under the same square root. Now I press the down arrow to go to the denominator and we have two times one. So this is gonna give us our negative three plus solution and that's gonna give us this value here. Now a nice little shortcut when you want the minus, just scroll back up to what you typed in first and press enter and it'll recopy it. And then you could just scroll left up to the plus sign and go up to the plus sign here and just write minus and it'll just switch it to a minus like this. You press enter and it gives you both answers all at once. Now remember, we're rounding to the nearest hundredth. So if we look at our first answer here, we have a five in the hundredths place. And if we look to the right here, we have a four, and that's gonna tell us to round down. So our first answer is gonna be 1.85. So here's our first solution. If in our first answer, let's say we had a five here in the thousandths place, then that would tell us to round this up to 1.86. But since we have a four there, the rule is if we have something less than four to the right, then we round down. So now for our second solution, we're gonna have x equals, and for this one, we look to the hundredths place as a five, and to the right is a four, so we're rounding this one down as well to x equals negative 4.85. So here are our two solutions. So now we move on to the part three questions, and every question here is worth four credits. Question 33, we have the senior class at Hills High School is purchasing sports drinks and bottled water to sell at the school field day. At the local discount store, a case of sports drinks costs $15.79, and a case of bottled water costs $5.69. And then we have the senior class has $125 to spend on drinks. So now for the first part, if X represents the number of cases of sports drinks and Y represents the number of cases of bottled water purchased, we have to write an inequality that models this situation. So remember here, X represents the number of cases of sports drinks and sports drinks cost $15.79 for a case. So I'm just gonna put an X over here so that I know that X corresponds to this dollar amount. And then Y is gonna correspond to the cost for a case of water. So I'm just gonna write the Y over here. And the senior class has $125 in total to spend on drinks. So now the inequality we're gonna set up here, we're gonna do 1579, so 15.79 times X, and this represents the total cost of the sports drinks that are $15.79 per case. And then we're gonna add this to, we have 569, so 5.69 times Y, and this is the total cost of the cases of water. And this part we just have to think very carefully about. The amount of money they have to spend is 125. So now we have to think here, is this less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to? Well, if you think of this, this is the total bill. Okay, this is how much they're gonna spend when they get to the register when they buy this stuff. So if you show up to the register and you only have $125 in your pocket, your total bill better be less than or equal to that amount. Because if you show up and your total bill rings up to let's say $200 and you only have $125, then that's not gonna work out. 200 is not less than or equal to 125. They're not gonna sell you it. They're gonna make you put some cases back. Okay, so that's why in this case, it's going to be less than or equal to. So next we have nine cases of bottled water are purchased for this year's field day. And we're gonna use our inequality to determine algebraically the maximum number of full cases of sports drinks that can be purchased. So for this one here, remember, bottled water corresponds to the variable y. So we're gonna say in this case here, let y equals nine. So if we have y is equal to nine, this is going to give us, we're gonna have 15.79, times x plus we have 5.69 times 9 and we're setting this less than or equal to 125. So I'll just get some of the arithmetic we need out of the way. So we're going to do 5.69 and we're multiplying that by 9 first. But then whatever this product is here, ultimately we're going to be subtracting that on both sides. So I'm just going to do this all in one step, 125 
and we're subtracting 5121. So this minus 5121, because we're gonna need these values in a moment. So now we'll just record these values. We have 15.79 times X plus, and this product worked out to 5121. So we have 5121, and now less than or equal to 125. And now we'll subtract, we have minus 5121 on both sides. So we're just gonna show this work over here. And now when we do the subtraction, we already did this work in the calculator. We're gonna have on the right side here, we're gonna have after the less than or equal to, this difference works out to 73.79. So now we have on the left side, we're just left with 15.79 times X. So now we're gonna divide both sides by 15.79 and this is gonna tell us what X is less than or equal to. So one last step here, we're just gonna divide by 15.79. So we have 15.79, and this is gonna work out to this value here. So now we cancel out, and we're gonna have X is less than or equal to, and we're gonna just write out this whole decimal. We have 4.673, 210, and then 893. And if we look here, notice that to the right of the decimal is a six. So we should round this up to five full cases. <laughs> But no, this is a very, very, very dangerous bear trap. We have to think about why do we have to round this down to four and not round it up to five? Well, if we think about this equation here, we have 15.79 and we're multiplying that by X. But I'm going to say here that we have to round it down to four. And then we have plus 5.69 times nine. So we work this out here and notice that our total bill is less than $125. It's okay if it's equal to 125, but in this case it worked out less than. But let's see what happens if we round this up to five. So let's say instead we had said, all right, I'm gonna try to buy five cases of the sports drinks. Well, if we switch this to a five instead, notice now that our total bill goes over $125. So we're gonna have to round this down to four because we won't be able to buy all of the drinks for a total bill less than or equal to 125. Question 34, we have the path of a rocket is modeled by the function h of t equals this quadratic function here, where h is the height in meters above the ground, and t is the time in seconds after the rocket is launched. And we have to sketch this graph on the set of axes below first. So the first thing I'm doing here is going over to the y equals, and I'm just going to type this function in. We have negative 4.9, and we're going to use x instead of t. So we're going to have x squared, and then we're going to write plus 49 times x. And now if we press graph here, notice that we're not gonna see anything. And it's all about the scale that they gave us. Notice that this goes up to 150 and it goes out to 15. So I would go to the window here and I would clear this out and start it at zero. And I would stop this at 15 because that's how far out the graph goes that they gave us. And then remember this started here at zero on the Y axis. So I'll clear out the Y minimum and switch it to zero. And then I'll switch the Y maximum to 150. And now what you'll notice here when we press graph is we get a much better picture of what's going on. But if we're going to put a sketch here of the graph onto this, what I want here is a table of values. So I'll just press second graph here like this, and we're just gonna copy down these values that we have here. Now they're telling us to sketch the graph. So that tells us we don't have to be super precise here because notice that we have values like 44.1 and 78.4. So they're not expecting you to get out a magnifying glass and getting that super close, but you just have to be within reason when you sketch this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and plot these points. Now, one thing to point out before I connect these points here is that for values like 44.1, notice the y-axis, they're counting by fives. So 44.1 is really close to 45. 78.4 is really close to 80. So that's how I got my approximation for these points to be as precise as possible. And I knew that this was a quadratic shape here. So if any of my points are out of place, I'm not gonna see that nice upside down U shape here. So now I'm ready to connect these points. So 
So for the second part of this question, we just have to state the vertex of this function, which is our turning point. And notice the turning point happens up here, and this is occurring here at t equals 5. So if we look at the table, when t is equal to 5, we have the function value is at 122.5. So we'll just write that over here. We have 5 comma 122.5. So that's going to be our turning point, but we'll just write it over here in this space. We have 5 and then comma 122.5. That's our vertex. But if we want to be 100% sure here, we could just press graph and we could just trace the maximum value here because the vertex is occurring at the maximum. So we could press second trace and then number four here. So number four is going to help us trace the maximum. So I go before the maximum first and I press enter once and then I scroll to the right of the maximum. So I go over the top of the hill. I press enter a second time and a third time. And notice that it's telling us here that x equals 5, y equals 122.5. Now, I know we have a bunch of zeros and then a 5 here. The calculator isn't perfect. If we want to be super, super precise for this, we could use that formula negative b over 2 times a. So if we take the b value here, 49, we could just write here, we're going to write a fraction. We have negative b, so negative 49 over 2 times the a value is the coefficient of the square term. So I have 2 times negative 4.9. And if I do it this way, it's going to tell me right away that my vertex occurs at t equals 5. And then if I plug 5 into the function, I get 122.5. So that's the most precise way to do this. But tracing is a really nice option. So for the last part of this question, we have to explain what the vertex means in the context of the situation. So if we go back here, remember this question was talking about the path of a rocket modeled by the function h of t. And h of t is the height in meters, t seconds after the rocket is launched. So if we think about this here, at t equals zero, the rocket is on the ground because it's zero meters above the ground. And then 10 seconds later, the rocket comes back to the ground. So the vertex represents the point where the rocket reaches maximum height. So it takes five seconds for the rocket to reach a maximum height of 122.5 meters. Question 35, we have a software company kept a record of their annual budget for advertising and their profit for each of the last eight years. And these data are shown in the table below. And the first thing we have to do here is write the linear regression equation for this set of data. So we're going to use the calculator for this question. And at some point, we have to find the correlation coefficient. So what we want to do before we find the linear regression equation is we want to turn the diagnostic on. So we're going to go to the catalog here. I'm going to press second zero. And I have to scroll down to the letter D, and that's going to take a while. So a shortcut is I could press alpha, and then I'm going to find the letter D is at x negative 1. So I press alpha, and then x negative 1, and that sends me to the letter D, so that now I don't have to scroll as far. And I scroll down to diagnostic on, and I press enter, and I press enter again. And now the diagnostic is on, so that way when we find the linear regression, it's going to include the correlation coefficient. So it'll just save us a little bit of time. So now we're going to press stats, edit, and I'm going to type in the X column here, we have these values here, and then that's going to go in L1. And then for the Y values, that's going to go in L2. So now that we have everything typed in, we're going to press stat, go over to calculate here. So we're scrolling to the right. And then linear regression is option four on this calculator. So I'm going to press four. And then I just keep pressing enter all the way down to calculate here. And this is going to give me all the values that we need. So now we could write our linear regression equation. We're going to have y equals a times x. And a is equal to 0 0.41. So we have 0 0.41 times x and then plus b. And b is equal to minus 2.31. So here's our linear regression equation. And now for the next part, we have to state to the nearest hundredth the correlation coefficient of these linear data. So the correlation coefficient is the R value, and we're rounding to the nearest hundredth. So notice in the hundredth spot, we have an eight, and to the right is a six. And remember, if the number to the right is a five or higher, then you round up. So our R value here is going to be 0 0.99. So here's our correlation coefficient. So now for the last part, we have to state what this correlation coefficient indicates about the linear fit of the data. So what I'm thinking about here is that any correlation coefficient will fall between negative one or one. And the closer your correlation coefficient is to negative one or one, the stronger it is. So the fact that we have R equals 0 0.99, tells us we have a strong positive correlation because it's very close to positive one. If it was r equals negative 0.99, then we would have a strong negative correlation. And as your correlation coefficient moves towards zero, it gets weaker. And if it's basically at zero, then there's no correlation.
So now what does this correlation coefficient tell us about the linear fit of the data? Well, since our correlation coefficient is so close to one, that tells us that we have a near perfect linear fit for the data because what you have to remember is the stronger your correlation coefficient is, the closer it is to negative one or one, the better the linear fit is going to be for the data. Question 36, there's a few things we have to do, but first we're going to graph the system of inequalities on the set of axes below. So the first thing that I'm thinking of is y equals mx plus b. For that first inequality, I want to get that inequality in the form of mx plus b, because once you have a linear inequality in this form, you could identify the slope and the y-intercept, and that's going to make it much easier to graph. So that'll tell us these two very important things. So I'm starting off with this first inequality here. And to solve for y, we only have to do one step here. We're going to divide both sides by negative 2. So we divide everything by negative 2. And that's going to give us, on the left, we're going to have y. And now we divided both sides by negative. So the inequality is going to flip to a greater than. And 3 over negative 2, I could call this negative 3 halves times x. And then 12 divided by negative 2 is minus 6. So a little fraction concept, just know that when I have something like 3 over negative 2, this is the same thing as negative 3 over 2, and this is the same thing as negative, and then 3 halves like this. So there's three different ways you could write it. So now that we have this identified, this will tell us the slope is negative 3 halves, and the y-intercept is negative 6. So the first inequality I'll graph in blue. So we have a y-intercept at negative 6. So we go down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're starting here on the y-axis. And now our slope is negative 3 halves. So that means we could go down 1, 2, 3, and then over 2. And if I want to go the other way, I'm going to go up 1, 2, 3 to the left 2 like this. And notice that I have the straight line going here. So I can't go any more this way, so I'm going to continue it this way. I'm going up 1, 2, 3, and to the left 2 like this. And I'm just going to keep doing this until I get to the end of the graph here. So I'm going up 1, 2, 3, and then over 2 like this. And notice that we have strictly greater than. So that means that when we connect these points here, we're going to do it with the dotted line. So now I put my arrows at the end to indicate that this will go on forever. And since we have a greater than, we're going to shade above this line. So next we'll graph x is greater than or equal to negative 3. So for this one, we're going to have a vertical line that passes through the x-axis at negative 3. Because x equals negative 3, the equation passes through the x-axis at negative 3. It looks like this. It's very tempting to say x equals negative 3 goes like this through negative 3 on the y-axis. But that's a very dangerous bear trap. And students mix that up because they think the x-axis is horizontal. So x equals negative 3 must also be horizontal. But no, be very careful with that thinking. Technically, the x-axis is the line y equals 0. Okay, And if you want to check that, just graph that in the calculator. You just type in y equals 0. And I promise you it will go over the x-axis. So now that we have this, we're going to go over to the x-axis at negative 1, 2, negative 3 over here. And we're just going to draw a vertical line through that point. So now I'll throw arrows at the end of this line to just show it's going to go on forever. And I'm making this line solid because it's greater than or equal to. So now we just have to shade to the right of this line like this. So we're going to shade everything here to the right and just make sure that we cover all this space. Now, one thing that you have to do to get full credit is you have to label at least one of the inequalities. But me personally, I just label them both. So we have this first one here is negative 2y is less than, and we had 3x plus 12 like this. And then the one in red over here, this was x is greater than or equal to negative 3. And then another thing we have to do here, this is a very annoying point to miss out on. We have to label the solution set S. So the overlapping region here, we're just going to make an S like this just to show that this is our solution set. So now for the last part of this question, Allison thinks that 2, negative 9 is a solution to the system. We have to determine if Allison is correct and justify our answer. So in order for Allison to be correct, 2, negative 9 would have to fall within the solution set. So let's see. We're going to start at the origin, and we're going to the right 2 and down 9. So we're going down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And notice that this point falls right on the dotted line. But any point on the dotted line is not a part of the solution to the system.
So now for part four, the final part of this test, and this last question is worth six credits. So for this question, we have Lydia wants to take art classes. She compares the cost at two art centers. Center A charges $25 per hour and a registration fee of $25, and Center B charges $15 per hour and a registration fee of $75. And Lydia plans to take X hours of classes. So for this first part here, we have to write an equation that models this situation where A represents the total cost of center A. So what I'm thinking about for this part, I'm thinking here of y equals mx plus b. And I know that we have a linear equation here because we have a constant rate of change. That's the $25 per hour. And we have a fixed amount. That's the registration fee. So just know when you have y equals mx plus b in word problems that m is the rate of change. Okay, so that is your rate of change. And remember, it's a constant rate of change when you're dealing with a linear equation. So this is going to be a constant rate of change. That's the $25 per hour. And the B value here is the fixed amount. And in this case, it's the registration fee. So that's our fixed amount. So you just have to be careful picking the right values and plugging them into the equation. So instead of Y equals, we're going to have A equals because they said A represents the total cost at center A. So the total cost at center A is going to be 25 times x because remember it's $25 per hour and she's taking x hours of classes and then we have to just tack on here plus the registration fee is $25 so that's going to get us through this first part here and now for part like this part over here we have to write an equation that models this situation where b represents the total cost at center b so it's the exact same idea as before but now we're going to have capital b equals and the rate of change for center b is $15 per hour. So we're going to have 15 times X and then plus the registration fee is $75. So we just tack on the plus 75. So now for this third part here, we have if Lydia wants to take 10 hours of classes, we have to use our equations to determine which center will cost less. So for this one here, we just have to plug in X equals 10 to both equations. So let's see here when X equals 10, we're going to have a equals we have 25 times 10 and then plus 25. So for this, we're just going to do 25 times 10. That's 250 plus 25 is 275. And now we do the same thing for equation B. So we have X equals 10. That's going to give us, we're going to have B equals, we have 15 times 10 plus 75. So we're just plugging in X equals 10 to this equation now. And 15 times 10 is 150 and 150 plus 75 is 225. So just looking at this, which one is going to cost less? Center B is going to cost less because 225 is less than 275. So now for the next part of this question, we're going to graph equation A and B on the set of axes below. And for this part, we could just use a calculator. The calculator is very reliable. So we're going to type in the Y1 spot. We have 25X and then plus 25. So equation A will go in the Y1 spot. And then equation B, I'm going to put in the Y2 spot. We have 15X, and then we have plus 75. Now, we don't have purple in the calculator. We have red, and then I think the closest we could get to purple is this magenta color, or whatever they call it. So I'm just going to scroll over until we find it. So there it is. That's as close to purple as we're going to get. So I'm just going to press Enter on this. And now we press Graph here, and notice that we don't see a whole lot of what's going on. In that rocket question, we had to extend this out a certain amount, and we went up a certain amount. But now our Y maximum has to go up to 180. So I'm going to go to Window here, and I'm going to extend the Y maximum to 180. And then in the X direction, let's see how far out are we going. We're going out to 10. So I'm going to switch the X maximum to 10. And now we press Graph, and we get a much better picture of what's going on here. So now let's think about our table. We're going to press Second Graph. And this is going to give us all the significant values that we need. So I'm just going to scroll up here until we get 0 through 10. So first, I'll plot the points for equation A. And notice this is where we run out of space here. We can't go up 25 anymore, so we'll just stop here. And now we'll connect these points with a straight line. And now at the end of the straight line, I'll just put an arrow here. Now we can't put an arrow going this way because the X axis represents the number of hours of classes that Lydia is going to take. So she can't take negative classes. So that just wouldn't make sense. So we'll just put an arrow this way. And now I'll just go ahead and drag this equation over to the line so that the line is labeled. I highly recommend that you label your equations when you graph them because they can take off points for things like that. And those are the annoying points that you don't want to lose. So next we'll go ahead and plot the points 
for equation B, and for equation B, the Y values are going to be in the Y2 column. So now I'll just go ahead and connect these points. And now I'll throw an arrow on at the end and we'll go ahead and drag equation B over by the purple line like this. So equation B, we'll just go ahead and label it like this. So now for the final part of this question, we have to state the number of hours of classes when the centers will cost the same. So if we look at our graph over here, that's the point of intersection. So if we look over here, the lines intersect at the point where X is equal to five and Y is equal to 150. That's our point of intersection. So if we want to be 100% sure, just look at the table here. When X is five, Y is equal to 150 in the Y1 column and the Y2 column. So that's the solution to our system of equations, but we just have to state the numbers of hours of classes when the centers will cost the same. So here, that's the X value, the numbers of hours. So that's gonna be when X is equal to five. So we would just say five hours and we just have to state it. We don't have to write anything else. So five hours would get us full credit. And that's our solution to the last part of this question.